Hi, hello, welcome back. Today, we're gonna to be talking about something I've been kind of excited about just because I wanted to talk about it, and that's what I come here to do, talk about things. Anyway, we are getting tomorrow, Electric Idol by Katie Robert, which is the sequel, next book in the same world as Neon Gods. It's been highly anticipated, and this is the Eros Psyche or Cupid and Psyche retelling. Now, I was lucky enough to get an advanced read of this book, and so I have already read it, and I want to use it as a vehicle to talk about both the myth of Cupid and Psyche, Eros and Psyche, and how it was reimagined for this series, and also to talk about Cupid and Psyche as kind of a parent story for a lot of popular forms and iterations that we kind of see come down the line in myth and story. And I do think I missed the original thread, but Katie Robert did tweet a thread last week, and I just, when I say missed, I, what she was referring to, and I'm going to throw out the last tweet of this thread because it is kind of taking a look at myth and tale and how these things kind of mutate and grow over time and how they are not static entities. So I'm going to throw it out, but I'm going to read it too. All this to say there isn't canon for myths or fairy tales or the like because they weren't static stories even after they were first written down. There is no original story that is the one true story. And so it kind of talks about the idea that these kind of tales started as oral traditions, how things were passed down, and how they kind of grew and mutated and morphed and took on lives of their own in different forms. So we're going to be starting with Cupid and Psyche, obviously, but the other tales that I particularly want to look at today are things that I view as direct offshoots of the Cupid and Psyche story and in kind of a ladder, so to speak. So next, I would think of East of the Sun, West of the Moon, and from there, Beauty and the Beast. And I think that there are thematic similarities in these tropes that, as a reader, I am particularly drawn to that make all of these parent stories so exciting for me. So they all have kind of like an arranged or marriage of convenience type setup. There is the juxtaposition of beauty versus monster or outward beauty and whether that lines up with inner beauty. There is often a curse. And then one of the things that often sets these apart for me is that generally there is this idea of women seeking knowledge or taking some degree of ownership over the sphere of their own lives. And in the stories, they are often punished for this. And depending on the story, this may lead to a trial of sorts. The heroine has to go on some kind of journey often. And then there is a kind of more active nature of the heroine saving the hero in some way. So that isn't to say that every element is going to appear in every iteration, that it has to be there to be the thing. And I think it appears in different degrees in each of the stories, which I'll kind of touch on a little bit. I'm not doing huge deep dives. I don't have huge scholarship in these stories, their history and whatnot. But as a reader, they are stories I'm drawn to, I'm excited by, and I'm interested in digging into and discussing. So Electric Idol is a retelling of the original Cupid and Psyche myth, Eros and Psyche, you know, Roman versus Greek names. I will often say Cupid just because that's what's in my head. But in the narrative, it is Eros and this character is Eros. And in this world we've already gotten a peek at in Neon Gods, Eros is the fixer for his mother Aphrodite, which makes sense within mythology. So he's a much darker character and a little bit darker and more dangerous than we have kind of culturally perceived of Cupid in particular. So I loved seeing that depth. But this darkness is contrasted against his more stereotypical golden boy looks. He is canonically very attractive, which fits with mythology as well. And Psyche is also canonically very attractive. She is in the myth. And in this iteration, we see her as a fat fashion influencer. I wanted to say blogger, but that's not the sphere we're in anymore. And there was something really exciting and empowering in seeing Psyche embodied in a fat woman, and I loved how it was done. She was unquestionably beautiful in the narrative, but the narrative did still combat what it means to be a fat woman, especially a fat influencer, a fat woman on the internet now. And the way we saw Psyche dealing with that and how she had kind of just accepted it as normal par for the course for her 
working life since that is her job. And then when Eros is introduced, how Eros responds and kind of we see him reacting to some comments for just innocuous posts. And we never see the comments, which is great, but we can kind of infer what they would be. And we get to see his reaction to that and the protectiveness of that. So I loved that piece. So just Eros and Psyche and how their beauty was reimagined for a modern audience. And then we got the monster side of Eros in the deeds he was forced to do and kind of his perception within the world, his reputation. Because Eros isn't necessarily a beast as we see in later iterations in Cupid and Psyche. And correct me if I remembered incorrectly, I did try and brush up before sitting down to chat. There was a perception in the myth that Psyche was told she was going to be marrying a winged beast. So in the original and in here, Aphrodite is our main antagonist. That is what makes sense. Aphrodite is jealous of Psyche for the attention she's garnering for her beauty. In the myth, it's a little bit too that Aphrodite's shrines are being ignored. And so there's a little bit more layers to that, but we know that Aphrodite is capricious. So that antagonist setup makes sense. And so in both, Cupid Eros is sent to murder Psyche and he is struck by her beauty. One thing I loved in the book here in Electric Idol is that we've seen Eros and Psyche interact already. Part of what sets off Aphrodite's jealousy is the attention around this interaction. And so Eros already has Psyche in his brain in some ways, and they've been moving in similar circles. But one of the things that is a stumbling block in carrying out this task is Psyche's kindness. So we already know that she is beautiful, but then her kindness is attached to that beauty and becomes a part of that beauty for the book. So we are very much looking at the internal and the external in terms of that theme. So in Electric Idol, we kind of move into a marriage of convenience type plot, which is always top notch. I love me a marriage of convenience plot. Being able to see it outside of like a more historical setting is always exciting. Granted, this is a little bit different world, it's a heightened, there are different dynamics, but still I enjoy it. It's one of my favorite tropes. So in both the myth and in Electric Idol, we move into this kind of marriage. Now in the myth, Psyche and Eros don't interact during the day. She only like sees this husband at night. And by sees, I don't mean that literally, she cannot see him. And so they build a relationship outside of the normal world, under the cover of darkness, very literally. And we see that as well for Eros and Psyche and Electric Idol. We move into kind of more the bedroom scenes and it starts with a kind of, we're gonna get this out of our system trope, which we know never ends the way our protagonists think it will. And so we're able to kind of peel back those layers in those intimate settings. So again, Katie Roberts sets up these really sexy, intimate scenes, but she has a way of tying that to the source material and forwarding the plot and our characters' journeys in a really stellar way. So in this way, in this, the spicier scenes in this book are basically probably some of the most rooted in myth that I think that it gets. And so I really love seeing what she did with that. There was also like thematic imagery, repeating of mirrors. The mirrors don't show up. I thought they did show up in the myth and that might be part of the way that it mutates and gets passed down because the way that it appears most traditionally is that Psyche is convinced by her sisters that she doesn't know if she's married to a monster in actuality because she's never seen her husband's face. And so she is convinced to get a glimpse of him while he's sleeping and she sees Eros, but that breaches trust and Eros is whisked away. Now there are moments in this where Psyche's sisters are like, he doesn't have a great rep though. Our mothers are feuding. This is not a good idea. But Psyche pushes back against that a lot more. So we don't really necessarily see that moment of seeing and that being the start of the rest of the story in the same way. So there is a moment with mirrors that is a little bit more intimate that I think is a take on that moment or this story's take on that moment, but it makes a much different choice. And I think that that's really interesting to kind of reimagine what a different choice might be, what that choice would be in, I don't wanna to say today's day and age because it's not, 
well, maybe it is. I don't know. We haven't seen the outside world yet in this. We know a little bit more about people being given freedom or exiled or whatever. But there's not that moment where he's whisked away, which leads to trials for Psyche. And she ends up actually going to Aphrodite in the original myth. Aphrodite's still mad and she's even more mad because then Cupid's heart is broken. Not necessarily the case here. So we don't necessarily get the trials, which honestly I was glad about. I spent a large portion of the reading dreading them and because that meant a separation of our leads. And part of what I loved so much in Young Gods was that like forced proximity, that intimacy that built based on that proximity. I thought it was done really well. So I was dreading the trials. Also, I wasn't necessarily feeling a quest. I just kind of wanted a romance. So there was less questing here no trials from Aphrodite, but it did stick the landing in a way that I felt was true to the myth and gave Psyche agency and still managed to kind of like, as readers, get us to a similar place with Psyche's journey. And I did like then the changes that that it made. There was also one throwaway line where it was kind of like an oh baby line. And like, I get it because it's a romance, but also there was a part of me that was like, <laughs> get it, baby, because he's Cupid. I don't know if that was intentional, but it gave me a chuckle and I appreciate it. So ultimately, this was similar to Neon Gods in the tone, in the heat. I really enjoyed it. And then it gave me a way to kind of spin down the path of these stories. So even though Cupid and Psyche is one of my favorite Greek myth parent stories, probably because it spurned all of these offshoots that I love so much. I think I have only read one other like straightforward Cupid and Psyche retelling. And if you have other examples or know of other Cupid and Psyche retellings, I would love for you to leave those below because I would love to read them. But the one I know and I think is most famous is Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. I read this book, but it's been a second. And so this is a retelling told from the sister's point of view. And that's about what I remember. I do remember reading it and trying to figure out if there was allegory, Christian allegory there. I'm sure there was. I don't think I was able to unpack it or parse it, but I also found that interesting. I'm like, what allegory are we putting in a retelling of a Greek myth? I don't know. But that, if you're looking for the most straightforward Cupid and Psyche, is the most spot on, I know, but at the same time, it's frustrating because it's not a direct view of Cupid and Psyche, right? We're not following that inherent love story. And I mean, we can have discussions about whether it's a love story too, but I'm not going to. So I mean, it's a myth. So it's never, myths and fairy tales and whatnot are never gonna have perfect love stories. But Cupid and Psyche has the most direct link to East of the Sun, West of the Moon, which is one of my favorite fairy tales for retellings, even though I don't know if I've read a whole, whole lot recently. I'll talk about some of them. But why I think this is the closest is that it still has that quest and that journey. Here we get the introduction of the Eros type character showing up as a polar bear for our heroine. I think it's a polar bear, some kind of bear. So we get that animal appearance for the first time. I mean, there's the snake reference in the Cupid. It doesn't, it's where we start to see that appear. And it has a similar setup in that the heroine gets a look at her husband's face. So she doesn't see him as a human during the day. She just, you know, communes with the talking bear and then connects with this man at night and has this deep relationship with this man and doesn't know much about him, is convinced to look on his face. That keeps a curse from being broken. He's whisked away to a mountain and is supposed to marry, I believe, a troll princess or queen. And so then our heroine has to go on a quest east of the sun and west of the moon to rescue him. I'm gonna get where some of you may be thinking in a second if it's a new thought, if you haven't heard of this story before. So when I was growing up, I think the most famous young adult retelling of this was East by Edith Pateau. I haven't read that in a while, but I loved it and it was everywhere. There was another YA retelling around 2008 that I actually missed called Sun and Moon, Ice and Snow by Jessica George Day. And so I feel like there was another retelling in that time because I feel like I was very connected to that story as a teen. 
but I don't remember what it was. There has most recently been a YA book called Echo North by Joanna Ruth Mayer. This I did read, but I remember nothing. And I'm really sorry. I think this is like kind of like the perfect example for me of why I may rate things three stars now. Like three stars to me doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I had a good time, but I might not remember it. There's a lot of things. I don't know. Anyway, so that exists. And then one that sticks with me pretty significantly as an adult fantasy is Once Upon a Winter's Night by Dennis McKinnon. Now, by sticks with me, I mean I have very fond memories of reading this book. This was actually like, I think maybe one of the first hand cells in Barnes & Noble I was given. Generally, I probably looked very suspicious as a teen in Barnes & Noble, or maybe they just know how teens behave. Because I would avoid booksellers, and I probably looked suspicious, but really, I just didn't want to be recommended books. <laughs> that I would like maybe not be interested in and have to put back because I didn't want to offend anybody. But also I had so many books I wanted to read. I, it, it was a lot of overthinking and anxiety. Are we surprised? But this day I was looking for fantasy Rex, was handed this book and I remember really loving it. And it was the traditional like polar bear shows up. It was that long fantasy where you're like in that world for a while. I still have it in my childhood bedroom. I was tempted to pick it back up over Christmas. I did read some reviews of it though, and I don't know that I'd ever read reviews of it because it was pre-internet reviews for me that I read it, and it doesn't look great on the reviews, so I don't know if it's gonna hold up for me as a reader now, but I remember it being, along with East, one of the more faithful retellings. Which brings us to A Court of Thorns and Roses. Now, I am by no means an expert on this book or this series, but I did read it when it came out, as it came out, and I see it very frequently comped online to Beauty and the Beast or people in comment sections being like, did you know this was a Beauty and the Beast retelling or did they know this was a Beauty and the Beast retelling? Which I don't begrudge because that's the most popular form of the story and what people would know the most easily. It does sometimes make me wanna fight in the comment sections though, which is dumb and I restrain myself because I'm not gonna rob that joy of discovery from someone. But this first book, not the whole series, but the first book, is an East of the Sun, West of the Moon retelling. And honestly, that is what saved it for me as a reader when I first read it. I was waiting for those beats. She goes on a quest. She goes under the mountain. There is a troll queen. Like it is East of the Sun, West of the Moon. But again, it's understandable why most people view it as Beauty and the Beast because it's the more popular story and it has so many similar plot beats and themes because they're all kind of stemming from the same parent story family. And Beauty and the Beast, I think, needs the least explanation. It, along with Cinderella, I would argue are two of the most common retellings. And we're seeing lots of iterations where people are, you know, whether they're going a more disney version of that, whether they're going like a little darker with the original or adding an extra dark layer to it, but that parent story and that structure is the most known. Now, what I find interesting in Beauty and the Beast is that it gets rid of that journey at the end. Like it's not as prolonged a journey in many ways. Our other heroines, Psyche and our heroine in East of the Sun, West of the Moon are kind of like making amends. But at the same time, like should they have to make amends for their curiosity? But there are still repercussions for Bell's curiosity in Beauty and the Beast. That's, you know, where we get the end. So I think on some level, there is something to be explored and dug into in terms of what is being punished in these stories. Not that that hasn't been done, just that I'm not going to do it here. And yet our heroines in these stories are often given some of the most agency, especially in like Cupid and Psyche and East of the Sun, West of the Moon, they get to go on a quest. And so it takes us outside of the more immediate world. Cupid and Psyche and East of the Sun, West of the Moon open up the world a little bit more. So we start with a very contained, our heroine has kind of a very small world, even if she's the center of that small world at first. And then she moves into kind of a space with this husband that's a very contained world. And then in terms of getting to that ending and that resolution and saving the hero, she experiences more of the world and the fact that she gets to go on the journey at all in whatever iteration that 
that may be. And in Beauty and the Beast, we see a similar thing, but the end is a little bit more condensed and we don't get that overall journey. So she's kind of returning to what she's already known. But in all of them, she has to make the choice to return. And even though it doesn't feel like a choice because it's coming as a consequence of an action, she is given an opportunity to walk away. Now, what her life looks like on the other side of that, if she did walk away or if she has a life, I don't, that's a, that's in question too. But yeah, I just love this grouping of stories, this family of stories. And I think each one offers such unique spins on it. So they're all part of the same family, but they all have these little differences that give them their own unique flair because they are distinguishably different stories still, and yet they exist as part of this larger conversation. And now we're seeing all of these different stories twisted in different ways as well. So the conversation continues and the family story continues to morph. So selfishly, I, I yes, would like some more East of the Sun, West of the Moon retellings. So I don't know if I have the patience for the quest that I think I do. Maybe I'm just looking for a different variation, a different flavor of that Beauty and the Beast type retelling that that offers. I definitely would love to see more Cupid and Psyche retellings too, because I think we kind of lost those in favor of Beauty and the Beast retellings. And I do think that makes sense because it is the most kind of pervasive within the larger culture. Beauty and the Beast has plot beats that are recognizable to the casual reader, and it's familiar enough and loved enough that the casual reader or someone that may not pick up a much denser retelling would pick that up, and they're able to see the twists and the differences and the commentary that might result from that a little easier. But yeah, I just, I think it's all very interesting. I'd be interested to hear what your favorite story is. If you have like a distinct favorite, maybe you don't. If you do have more Cupid and Psyche retellings and East of the Sun, West of the Moon, for sure, I would love to hear those. In terms of Beauty and the Beast, like I know most people probably know these, but some of my favorite recentish retellings are Her So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Tenemir, which also introduces the portal fantasy aspect, Uprooted by Naomi Novik, which is more the like, lyrical adult fantasy take on it. When Beauty Tamed the Beast by Eloisa James, which is like your historical romance take on it. And historical romance, like a lot of genres, likes to mine fairy tales and popular stories for the familiar plot beats and the twists and excitement of seeing how it's interpreted. So I know there are more there for sure as well. And this is just barely scratching the surface of Beauty and the Beast retellings. If you have Beauty and the Beast retellings that you particularly like that I didn't mention, I would love to hear those as well. If you have thoughts about how all of these stories are kind of in conversation with each other, what you feel the most pertinent elements of the stories are, the themes that you are most excited to see explored in all of them, I think there's just so much to discuss here. And I think that Electric Idol is a really fun example, like I said, of how those themes and the kind of tropes and bits that we enjoy from those stories can be pulled while also kind of flipping it a little bit and asking us to kind of take a look at what that would look like for a more modern audience. Like Katie Robert said in the tweet that I referenced at the beginning, none of these stories are static. And I think that's what makes this so exciting is that they're always kind of in conversation with each other and they're always kind of mutating to show us what we respond to as readers when the iteration comes out. So like I might respond to East that came out in the 2000s very differently now to then. And if I were to retell East of the Sun, West of the Moon in a similar vein today, I might do it much differently. But we're seeing these stories continue to mutate. And it begs the question of how the modern iterations will continue that conversation going forward. Will any of these iterations stand on their own significantly enough that they become part of the larger conversation around the work? And I don't mean necessarily like in a scholarly way, but like will we start seeing different elements pop up or appear? What imagery starts to carry with it 
that becomes recognizable even if we can't really tangibly point to what exactly makes it recognizable. I don't know, I think there's so many layers here, but just knowing the original story and knowing our society that we live in is part of what makes something like a fat influencer psyche so impactful. And that choice in and of itself is in conversation with the source material and the society that we live in. So also I would love as you read, have read, are reading Electric Idol to know what pieces or twists in that as well that are in conversation or pulled from Cupid and Psyche, Eros and Psyche that you responded to most, thought were the most clever, the most fun, what have you, or what changes you thought were the smartest? What were the ways that deviating from the original served the story in new ways? And where might that take us? You know, you don't have to pause at that. That's just a hypothetical. But yeah, I'm babbling again now, but this stuff excites me. If it also excites you, like and subscribe for more babbles to come. But thanks for hanging out and geeking out with me about this. Read something good and yeah, bye.